Hello, and welcome to Armory Live. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure to introduce our next Armory Live panel discussion, Challenges in Digital Art Today, Production, Presentation, and Preservation. We welcome moderator Vasela Shratinovich, Cross Department Director of Contemporary Art Initiative in partnership, the Phillips Collection, to address some of the complex issues in digital art today. This discussion brings together critical reflection from different perspectives. Artist expression and practice, Daniel Kanogar, Madrid-based artist, institutional display presentation education, Nick Apotzeles, <laughs> lecturer in John Hopkins University, and historical framework in the current market, Ala Surveys, collector and founder of Surveys Family Collection, Brussels, who join us remotely. New for this year, our Army Live program is streaming live, so I'd also like to welcome our online viewers. We will have a brief Q&A at the end of the hour in which we'll fill questions from the room and from online. So please feel free to send your questions throughout the discussion. Without further ado, I'd like to turn things over to our speaker. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Aisha. Uh, thank you all for coming this uh, afternoon, Sunday afternoon. It's sunny and tempting to be outside. So um, I am Vesela Sertanovic from the Phillips Collection. And Aisha, you said a lot of things that I was going to say. So we'll jump in into the conversation, and we have more time to talk about art and digital art. It's a great pleasure to be in company of Daniel Canogar, uh, artist based in Madrid, and uh, my colleague from DC, Nick Apostolides, and Alain. Um, is joining us, as, as we said, hello, bonjour, uh, from Brussels, due to the ban of European travelers to New York or to the United States. Here we are, using the truly and digital technology today in practice. So thank you for joining us, Alain. Um, as the title said, we will be trying to tackle some of the issues of digital art today. It's impossible to be too comprehensive. We only have one hour. We will not pretend to give you specific answers. Just really raise questions about it and kind of approach digital art from our own practices and our own experiences. Uh, but before we move on with our discussion and introduction of the speakers, I would like to give a, like a brief overview, a very brief, of digital art for better understanding what it means, for its scope, for its complexities. Because we often think of digital art as something disconnected from the history um, that is off today. But it, digital art has its root in technology and art history. So I just want to give a little bit of background so we can situate it right there in a bigger context and then tackle the issues from there that are critical to today. What is digital art? Um, how is it related to technological innovation? What is its historical trajectory? What is it the experience? What is it creative potential, um, expression, meaning? How do we document? How do we preserve or archive digital art? How do we present it and experience it? All these things that are different from something that we think of as a traditional work of art in terms of painting, sculpture, or as an object. So, um, as I said, obviously, in an hour, we will see how far we get. Uh, at the very end, please keep your questions. We'll open up um, uh, the room to question and answer. And love to hear your comments, questions. We're about the diversity of opinions here. So hold on for the last minutes of the presentation. Um, so let's start with the very basic question. What is digital art? I mean, it seems such a simple question. And to put it simply, it's art that uses technical or technological innovation, right? Um, and it challenges traditional notion of what art is and how do we experience it? And those are the questions that particularly interest me as a curator and um, as somebody who talks and thinks about experience of art. Um, the term digital art actually goes back to early 80s um, when we had the first evidence of program painting program based and run on a computer. Um, it was connected to that pa uh, painting program. Digital art is, as we know, generated by computer. So without computer, there is nothing. It can be drawn, scanned, manipulated by software. It can be a, in a form of animation, 3D scanning in terms of sculptural scanning. Uh, it can be manipulation of video images, film images, or it can be projected in a space and experiencing the space. Given this large and powerful impact of digital art today, it's important then to, again, 
put it in a larger context. On one hand, we have a technological development. On the other hand, we have art historical development. And digital art fluctuates between the two. Um, without computers, there will be no digital art. So when we really trace it back, in the late 40s after the Second World War, uh, American government supported the research in computer-based art. And it took maybe 20 years or so from engineering point of view to develop first the digital art or something that we now may be calling digital art that goes back to the mid 60s. And then thinking back, um, Alan Kaprov in 1968 had his piece, Hello, where he actually used the cameras in Lower East Side, uh, in Boston, excuse me, um, and placed it in various parts of the city, connecting people or making people to participate and talk to each other from, from that um, uh, perspective. And then we have Andy Warhol, who in 1987, or 1985, excuse me, uh, I'm not certain about the date now, used the first Commodore computer. Um, and I remember that was that time in school, the, the, the Informatica program uh, that we had in Sky School, used the computer using the manipulating the image of Debbie Harry um, at that time. So said all, the, all this said, Digital art is not new, it's not of today. It's been around, obviously, for more than 50 years, but because of its impact, because of social media, we think of it as something that is a recent phenomenon. Obviously, it's not. So, um, thinking of that, um, I'd like to invite our speakers to um, talk about these challenges that we have now from their own practice. And we will start with Daniel, uh, because he has some visuals and because he is a maker and an artist. So we'll talk about that. Then we'll move to Nick Apostolides, who will be telling us um, from his teaching perspective, from his per perspective of uh, independent curator and art administrator, who done so many uh, other things. And then we'll turn to Alain. Um, a great opinionated, passionate, critical mind, and one of the first collector of digital art uh, who supported artists who are unknown and unrecognized, creating work that is not painting, right, Alain? Um, and uh, uh, having his space in Brussels, in Loft, featuring his collection. So uh, with that, I turn my microphone to Daniel, a Madrid-based artist who lives between Madrid and in Los Angeles, and uh, whose work is really on the whole challenging the notion of what art is and how digital art changes our experience of art and, and life. So Daniel, I turn it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Vesela. I'm gonna, I think I need the clicker here. So as an artist, I have been thinking a lot about how uh, digital technology has transformed um, the way we store and circulate uh, information, knowledge, art, ultimately. Um, I'm particularly interested in, in understanding how there's being a shifting materiality of the, of the, or physicality of how this knowledge and information is stored. And one of the consequences of, of this kind of advent of, of, of digital technology is that it's created a lot of garbage. Um, I, as a kind of avid visitor of recycling centers, uh, junkyards, and occasional dumpster diver, um, find the ruins of obsolete technologies uh, that are accumulating at an ever-increasing pace. I often salvage these technologies, and I bring them to the studio. <clears throat> So for example, I'd like to start out with this, a series that I started in 2014 called Small Data. It's my museum or collection of obsolete technologies. These are all broken, dead, found technologies that I've salvaged, that I bring back to the studio, and I present them on these shelves that uh, have almost like a still life kind of, I like to think of them as contemporary still lifes, and an overhead projector that activates them, brings life back into these dead technologies. You can see the overhead projector here. Um, the work is basically, this is for example, the broken scanner uh, or a scanner that kind of scans itself back to life. Um, a printer 
that uh, is kind of malfunctioning, but also printing itself back to life. I do a little bit of forensic work by these broken pieces. I try to find online what device they belong to. I like to think of this work as archaeology, as this kind of archaeology of, of, of the ruins that this kind of digital fast-paced changes is leaving on its wake. So this is an ongoing project. I have 30 of them now. Um, but uh, basically, I'm, I'm really kind of trying to understand this passage from these material media to this new world of cloud-based uh, technologies and streaming online services that have kind of dissipated or made intangible how we store information, knowledge, and even art. I'd like to tell you a little bit about a, a project I did uh, three years ago. It was an homage to the dying DVD. Uh, there's perhaps an historical arc that began with the printed, with the Gutenberg, with the printed uh, press, that ended with the DVD as a long historical 500 year journey of using some form of material media, whether it's a book or a microfiche or more recently a DVD to store information. So um, quick picture of some of my sources and my dealers, my DVD dealers from junkyards to flea markets to closing video store rental locations where I would basically buy their entire stock. These are the cemeteries. These are the, the last stop for, for, in this case, for the DVDs. So what I ended up doing is this piece called Sicka. It's an artwork that has 2,400 DVDs, movies in DVD format. I viewed all these films, and I collected fragments from each one of the films, which is what I am then projecting back onto the surface of the DVDs to create this kind of immersive audiovisual experience. The work is an attempt to almost capture the dissipating nature of the image. It's something that it's not, uh, not always glued to the source, to the material media that it once was so kind of intricately, intricately uh, connected to. It's um, also very much because DVDs are in essence are reflecting surfaces of like little mirrors. The little films that I project onto the DVDs bounce back into the space and create these very kind of phantasmagorical, very intangible uh, uh, reflections of the films. The public itself becomes a screen that receives the, the projected, uh, reflected images on their own bodies, almost like these visual tattoos that, that become like a second skin. Where is this? Sorry? Where is this? I did this piece in late 2017, presented it in 2018. But where was it presented? Uh, 2018. No, where? Oh, this was presented in the Museum of the University of Navarra in Pamplona and then in Madrid, in a, in a museum in Madrid. And what does Sika mean? Sika are the gold coins that were used in Babylonic times that had a little hole in the middle that people started sewing onto their clothes. Sika is the origin of sequin. And the, because the cluster DVDs look like a sequin, I thought there was an interesting reference. So as we kind of transform our culture from these kind of online services, where there is an absolute and total dematerialization of the, of the physicality of, of how information is stored, I enter this world of big data with pieces like Ripple, where um, it's an artwork that's connected to different news outlets, uh, CNN, BBC, Euronews, Al Jazeera, and as news items are posted onto uh, their web pages, I grab those videos and they become part of the artwork. They slide down the screen and you can see uh, how they leave a trace behind. So you can basically get your news through this piece, uh, though the, the en ensemble is very abstract. I wanted it to look very textile-like, almost like a Missoni kind of fabric. Um, that's basically created with the news at the moment. It's an attempt to create some kind of coherence from the excessive world of 24-7 broadcasting, from the fragmented nature of how we receive news. 
There's, uh, of course, a mixture of traumatic news items like a terrorist attack to a banal image of a viral video or, or whatever's being broadcast at that time. So a lot of my work is trying to kind of dive into this generative nature, not only the generative art, but the generative nature of the world we live in. Algorithmic reality is incessant. It's constantly flowing. It's constantly changing. It doesn't remain. What this means for artists is something I'm trying to figure out. Here's another piece that dives into our new encyclopedia, YouTube. It's a triptych reference to the formal uh, altar piece of, of a church of a, uh, in, in kind of European tradition. YouTube has this kind of oracle-like, um, shall we say, uh, element where we go to, uh, to reference and to search so many things. The work is interactive. The public has a, a, a kind of this iPad that you're going to see shortly where you can type in a query and that will immediately trigger the artwork to download the first 100 videos. In this case, I introduced volcanoes. It will go to YouTube and it will download the first 100 videos that appear on YouTube uh, under volcanoes. So you, your potential palette are four billion videos that are part of YouTube. Again, a hugely expansive, excessive, almost virally exploded uh, encyclopedia. And of course, depending on your query, the work will have different colors, different moods. If you're doing, like, say, Charlie Chaplin films, you're going to get this very elegant, abstract animation. If you do, uh, you know, Real Madrid soccer team, you're going to get the greens from the playing field. The liquid-like animation is very much about this kind of incessant flowing of information. Um, that um, well, I'll talk about that shortly. I th two or three more projects before we move on. Uh, this is a recent project, a loom. In this case, I'm also thinking about uh, kind of references to digital art and history of art. I really want to introduce data into art history. So this is very much about color field abstraction. But in this case, these Rothko-ish artworks are created with uh, the most uh, trending terms that are being looked at on Google and all the Google platforms. So it's basically I'm accessing Google Trends, and it shows you the top terms that what people are searching online. It's basically almost like getting an x-ray of what is on people's minds at any given moment. You can see in the artwork, the, the recipe book that the artwork has created, all the different terms that are trending at any given time because the work, as so much of my work is connected to the internet, is getting constantly updated every few seconds. And these are the words that scroll through the artwork, leaving this kind of dusty, um, almost like pigment-like trail behind it. Uh, the colors are determined by how high on the list the terms are. The higher they are, the more red the, the, the dye is. As those terms become less relevant in the list, they start turning to green and bluer, co uh, cooler colors. So again, this is trying to summarize the immensity, the vastness of the you know, millions of searches that are happening online at any given time into this coherent... Uh, uh, artistic experience. This is uh, my most recent piece. It's called Shred, and it's very much thinking about the, the kind of how the artwork itself has become de dematerialized. Uh, what the artwork is doing, it's, it's using NFTs that are getting posted on the, on the NFT platforms, and it's shredding them. This is maybe perhaps a little bit of my comment on what I think of NFTs. And with these shreds, it's kind of weaving into this live uh, uh, algorithmic uh, pattern. Again, very textile, like I'm very interested in the connection between textiles and algorithms. They have a, a very interesting history. We could talk about that at another time. But um, so this kind of abstract that is abstraction is constantly changing depending on all the NFTs that are coming online and being sold on the online platforms. They get momentarily revealed now and then. So you can actually see a lot of people talk about NFTs, but they don't really know what, what is being sold. So they actually capture the zeitgeist of the moment, this kind of references to 
emoji culture to uh, kind of 3D graphics, a video game culture. This is all kind of part of, of Shred. Again, it's a work that has a life of its own, that is constantly changing its patterns, its rhythms, depending on the artworks that are getting uh, posted. Um, and to kind of wrap things up, um, and thinking more specifically about art collections and archives and pinacotechs, this is a project I did for the Prado Museum uh, in Madrid. They were celebrating their bicentennial. Um, and they were kind of trying to think of the future of the museum as a museum that is basically now mostly experienced by people online, visiting the collection online. I decided to create uh, this piece where the entire, all the exhibited paintings are melted into this animation that slides down the screen. Uh, the paintings are melting, uh, partly from the theoretical influence of Zygmunt Bauman and his fabulous um, Liquid Modernity. It's a book that I, I absolutely love and read it several times, where he kind of speaks about this kind of uh, the fl constant fluctuation of this software modernity that we're living in, where uh, the kind of hard-edged uh, box-like shapes are, are kind of dissolved into this uh, liquid animation. These are generative artworks. This is a, a, it was on for four nights in, in Madrid, um, and it was just very exciting to kind of be able to, to create this, this piece uh, for, for the museum. And this has kind of led to the project I'm doing now with Vesela um, at the Phillips Collection. And I'll, now to wrap things up, I'll show you the, this is kind of shots of the installation where the Phillips Collection is also celebrating its, uh, its centennial, its 100 years since its creation. And here what I've done is I've um, used the, their collection, their art collection is getting projected on this three story wall that cascades down the stairwell. Um, and it's kind of video mapped perfectly onto the wall. So it basically starts at the upper level and it, and it kind of goes down the three levels of the museum. Um, there's momentary reveals where you can actually see the uh, artworks that are part of the part of the collection. But then again, they go to their default abstraction. The, the idea of them being in a stairwell is also a very kind of powerful symbol in itself. It's this kind of vertical dropping of art history in front of your eyes. It was a very collaborative project done, obviously, with Vesela, who believed in this from the beginning, with the museum staff. Uh, with an audiovisual company that put this together and with my team who, you know, we were able to kind of create this generative algorithmic work that never repeats itself. The paintings are always combined in different ways and in different methods. So that's about it. Oh, there's also a, a, a streaming service, speaking yes. of the dematerialization of the artwork. There's a streaming service on YouTube, and one that you can get there. And I just one final note. I think it is important for us as practitioners, as thinkers, um, to remain relevant. I think we really need to understand and figure out this hugely transformational ecosystem that has changed so many things about how we think about art, how we make art, how we circulate art. We really have to understand this so that we can really move forward and remain relevant. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, this was really incredible. So what we are seeing now, this is sort of transition to from artistic practice to curatorial as we go to Nick. Um, this is what you're looking at now is our YouTube channel uh, that actually launched the project under um, the umbrella of Digital Intersections, which is uh, an ongoing series of contemporary projects where we invite artists to do something specifically for us. And part of Daniel's work and project is belonging to that series. And we started this Digital Intersections as an expansion of something we call Intersections, which is the project where we invite artists to do something in situ. Well, given COVID restrictions and moving into the digital sphere, we expanded this. And Daniel is the second project being featured. So this was launched on Thursday as a prelude 
to the actual installation that is opening on this Tuesday. And um, you saw the installation slides, and if I had only known what I'm getting myself into, maybe this wouldn't have happened, but this is, you go with the flow, you trust your guts, and uh, we're extremely pleased to have this on view. And as you said, it's been the most collaborative uh, project I think I've ever done in many, many years behind me, um, working internally, collaboratively, and externally from A to Z. With that, and that was, speaking of challenges, that was one of the challenges that many of institutions have, where small institutions were not known for digital you know, art. Uh, I'm a curator of contemporary art, modern contemporary art, and art historian who has no expertise in digital art. So on that level, it was a true challenge and um, many more to come as we continue to do this. So with that said, uh, Nick, uh, why don't you take it over and continue to speak about your challenges? Absolutely, and um, thank you, Vesla, for including me. It's exciting to be here at Armory Live, and I'm looking forward to seeing your piece, Danielle, not only online, but, but in person back in DC uh, this week. So Vesela asked me to reflect a little bit about my teaching curatorial studies at Johns Hopkins in the Museum Studies MA program and what um, we're seeing in terms of curatorial practice, the perspective from students who are experiencing often um, have a lot of experience with digital art, maybe more than, than most of us, and the challenges that they perceive uh, moving into this field. So I have a few notes and I'll try to run through them quickly and, and, and we'll keep the program going. But um, I did want to start by just saying first and foremost, um, I found over the last 10 years of teaching that my students are concerned with the existential moment that we're in today, and that's the climate crisis. Um, they're looking critically at artists and institutions, for example, to see if digital media can help reduce the carbon footprint of the visual arts. To be honest, uh, uh, the outlook is not so good. Um, more than melting blocks of ice on a city street, my students are asking how much of the art of our time might be born digital? And could a change in the media of production disrupt the seemingly never-ending cycle of physical construction and expansion in art museums? They want to decide for themselves if digital art needs to be shown on an institution's walls to have that physical aura that so many of us for generations have sought in relation to art. And getting to our topic today, they're confronted with challenges of working as a curator in an era of emerging technologies. We've heard some of those already. How does one work with artists who sometimes are creating or partnering with those who are creating new technologies? How do you integrate these new technologies into an exhibition? How do you communicate the learning that stands behind such technologies? How much context does your audience need to provide? Especially when audience might not be familiar with the technology or the subtext an artist might be exploring. I think this is something that Omar Khalif did brilliantly in his exhibition, uh, Electronic Superhighway at the Whitechapel Gallery five years ago. Students also wanna know what came before, the pre-digital, and when and what will come next. They know that digital art didn't drop out of the sky, the histories that precede this era of art making are important to them. They're interested in learning about path-breaking curators, um, such as Barbara London at MoMA, establishing the Film and Media Art Collection and Exhibitions program there, Cherry Chapu at the Centre Pompidou in Paris, and his Les Immateriaux exhibition in 1985, which showed that um, new media um, exhibitions for the masses could explore new media and a kind of research platform for new media and philosophy. Um, here, I would just mention Andreas Brokman, a cura Berlin based curator and professor who's had a great influence on my research in this area, and, and many of my comments today are indebted to his generosity and guidance. Um, students also want to know what um, and if the digital requires an audience in terms of in a physical museum. Um, they're keen to understand how digital art is legitimized through collection. We'll hear a little bit from Alain commission and public display, as we've heard about at the Phillips, through the network of collectors, the art market, and institutional actors such as museums. This, for me, recalls um, the early days of network computers. I think of Maurizio Bollini's uh, piece, Sealed Computers, which, in which he installed networked computers on the floor of a gallery. The computers were having a conversation maybe with themselves, but there are no monitors, there's no graphic output, so we're left to wonder what was that conversation that might be taking place. Students want to know about artists working with media and scientists. 
The laboratory intrigues them. The places where scientific research and development are combined with artistic production. Um, here I'm thinking about the artist Daria Martin, um, who worked in the artificial intelligence lab at the University of Zurich to create her piece Soft Materials in 2004, documenting her experiences with humans and robots in performance and dance. Um, students follow the money. They know that artists need resources to do their work. They look into funding opportunities, whether by companies, by galleries, research grants, fellowships. Um, the studio labs like Canon in the uh, 1990s and at Xerox Park, more recently Google Arts and Culture, uh, their lab in Paris, uh, with its experiments online series. Uh, they're one, my students are wondering how these corporate or research funding um, paradigms uh, influence uh, artists, uh, how their work is driven, um, and how it's impacted. And finally, students care about representation and inclusion. They want to know where the media artists who are women of color and artists of the Southern Hemisphere are. Um, thinking of the work of Seiko Mikami and her Desire of Codes installation from 2011, which explores human memory and experience through robots and artificial intelligence. Students are hungry. They want to see digital art and media of all, uh, I would say media of all forms, from diverse perspectives around the world. They're not looking for a canon, they're looking for a kaleidoscope. In closing, the students I work with at Hopkins, they want an interrogation with the histories and the structures of museums. And those students who are focused on the visual arts want to diversify and democratize the authority of the art making experience. They sense that digital art could be an avenue to do this. If that technology, as well as the means of presentation, are accessible to all. They're exploring how art making production for the dis art making production can help enfranchise those who have been disenfranchised. And um, most of all, they love the discussion. Um, they like to uh, learn from each other, and so I'm gonna stop here. I look forward to continuing the discussion and hearing from Alain. Uh, can we have Alain? Ah, Alain is back. And now, um, we have to make a choice, I think technical choice, to either have you on screen or your PowerPoint. So Alain, you tell us when you're ready. I'm going to flip the slides yes. and you tell me yes. uh, when. Okay, so now we have keep, your first keep slide. Me for, keep me, give me four seconds. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Vezila, for inviting me, the Amori Show, for giving me the possibility to be there without being there, um, and, and my panelists. So I, like Nick, I will stay focused and short. And I, I thought it's interesting to take a step back a little bit. Uh, Vezela described what digital art was. It was art with uh, uh, the technological advances. Uh, we've seen what it can be through, through Daniel. And we talked uh, through Nick um, again what um, digital art, what our expectations were digital arts. What I would like to do is once take it one step back a little bit like a Google Earth image where you're moving out of uh, the, the narrow focus because in my opinion, digital art is not um, something which is separated by, from art and it's very important. Um, indeed, I started collecting digital art 20 years ago when nobody noticed or cared about uh, because I considered that um, my responsibility was to collect art related to, to my time. And very obviously, I thought that in 2200, uh, in history books, uh, people will look at the year 2000 and they, they will definitely see that computers and internet were something that absolutely changed the world and will stay in history forever. So I thought that if I was finding artists that were creating art, with this technology, I would be on something that was worth preserving for the next generation. So I thought um, useful to um, go back a little bit and define what, uh, what is art, for my, in my opinion. Of course, um, as Fezela mentioned, it is subjective, so it's only my point of view. Um, but this is the filter I'm using before acquiring any form of art, and digital art in particular. So Vesela, if you want to go with um, the slideshow. Okay, oops, excuse me, back, okay. Here we go, is this art? Yes, um, because very often a lot of debates about art are starting from the wrong point because are starting from different um, 
definition of arts. On, on your left side, you've got an, an artist called Domingo, Domingo Zapata. This artwork is selling for approximately $100,000 with a lot of success. Um, and it's having the, user, the necessary um, objects and element of images, you know, a super, um, superhero, a bit of trash, a bit of street art. And it's exactly it's it's um, it's exactly the aesthetic that uh, people are looking for. Is this art? In my opinion, it is not. On the right side, you've got Thomas Kincaid, which is um, one of the most successful selling artists in the United States. Um, he died a few years ago, um, and he, he produced enormous amount of posters that are in a lot of houses in the United States. And again, you, you can judge by yourself, um, but in my opinion, it is not art. Next slide, if you can, Vesela. Is, is this it? Yeah, Infinity Room by Kusama? Yes. Okay. So here in the Infinity Room of Kusama, you've got um, people queuing around the block, um, mostly to take a selfie because they are load only for 30 seconds inside um, the um, the infinity room. The same with the rain room, uh, big popular success. Um, and so um, in the first slide, you had that the money was uh, a present. In this slide, you have um, the attendance, which is present and is still not art, in my opinion. The third slide, if you want. So those are on a form of things that are considered art. I think that Andy Warhol is an extremely important artist, but um, today most people are thinking about its value. Uh, the, the millions or tens of millions it's representing, the same with Lucio Montana, depending whether it's um, uh, the number of flash, uh, the color um, will, will, will bring a very different price. But people are forgetting what Fontana is about. It's about infinity, it's about um, uh, space behind uh, and, and the, the, the infinity which is opening behind uh, the canvas. So is this financial art, art in my opinion? Um, still not. So the next slide. So now that I've been expressing with why I consider some form of art not art, I need to define what I consider art. And it's, it's pretty subtle in, in some way, but I, I'm, I will be using that's very nice quote from uh, famous collectors from Berlin, the, the Boros, um, uh, Karen and Christian. And I love this, this quote, which sum up exactly what I'm looking for in art. A lot of times when we first see work by an artist we don't know, we are irritated. That's the key point, irritated. We think we dislike it, but then we ask ourselves why, why we are, we feel like this. We try to find out what it, it is it that makes us comfortable, uncomfortable. And the more we go into this analysis, the more we love the art. Um, and we go to the next slide just to close up my uh, opening arguments. It is in fact um, that process that I'm looking for in art. It's a, it's a process uh, which will take me out of what I think I know and I think I like as an aesthetic and will bring me to, um, to another um, kind of dimension, uh, which is the Plato's cave, uh, describing um, the world as, as, a, as an illusion, uh, like shadows on the wall um, at the bottom of the cave where we are all chained and born and chained. And the, the aim in life should be to try to escape that um, cave and uh, reach another level of, of, uh, of reality and, uh, and knowledge. And this is what um, this is why I'm, I'm a happy collector of Daniel's work. Um, is that as you've seen, um, Daniel's is often making allusions to very important uh, elements of uh, our time. Uh, whether it's the news, whether it's uh, uh, the, the the hardware that we've been using for so long, and that we can animate in different form. So it is very important in my collecting that art, uh, that digital art, is art. Um, and that's the key, um, the key element that I'm looking for. Of course, I'm not considering art. Art has got its own challenges uh, to collect. Um, one of them is that you never 
uh, own a, a final object. Uh, it's a living object that you need to, to the help and the support of the artist to maintain alive uh, because the technology, the technological obsolescence is behind it. So uh, it's a very, um, it's a challenging um, endeavor, but a very rewarding because if you manage to collect um, art, which is talking so um, brilliantly about uh, a very urgent uh, subject in our society and which will be definitely coming back um, to haunt us in the next uh, hundreds of years, then you want to something. This, this is what my collecting is uh, focusing on. Thank you very much. I think I respected my time allotment and we may be catching up on the lost time. No, we're good with time, actually. Um, um, I hope that this raised a lot of questions. I think um, we, when we were talking among ourselves, we agreed that we will uh, kind of have a dialogue here on the podium with you remotely, Alain. Um, and, you know, challenges from production, from curatorial or institutional point of view and collecting. Um, and I think there is um, one, you wrote somewhere in one of your texts, I remember that uh, since you were at the art fair, that the sales of work that have technology or are digital art, as we would call them, are percentage-wise very low. And I think there is almost a resistance or fear to deal or collect these works of art for the reasons we mentioned, and that is technological aspect of it. How do you deal with it? Absoluteness on one hand, innovation on the other. You buy something on DVD or VHS, tomorrow it's gonna be, um, um, dead or not, you know, how do you live with art that is collectible, that has a place on the marketplace, but changes? And that is something I think that presents a challenge for us institutions, for you as an artist to kind of update your format and for you to collect something. So maybe we can among ourselves talk about that a little bit. I, I'd like to start by just, I think it's a great point and I think a lot of it has to do with the um, the newness of the, the medium in terms of the, the most recent iteration. So since the um, late 80s, early 90s, um, we have to remember that even when photography was introduced, uh, it was not really seen as an art form um, by many people. And certainly not in the museum community. Um, it was seen as something that was a, a, a form of replication, of reproduction. A tool. Um, a tool. It was not um, seen as an artistic process, although we know now and, and uh, I think it's v obviously very widely uh, accepted that the, even the earliest experiments in photography um, have great artistic value um, and, and merit. So I think that's one thing to add mm -hmm. to the discussion is just, um, and uh, you know, mu certainly in, from the institutional standpoint, museums were not uh, the leaders in terms of acknowledging photography as an art form, they resisted it. Um, and uh, video and media art in its earliest forms, for example, at MoMA, you know, really were collected in the library before they ever became part of the collection, of the art collection of the museum. Um, at the library starting in 1935 at MoMA and then not until the 60s um, and then later as organized into formal disciplines uh, with media and then media and performance. So I think part of it is the artists and the collectors will always be ahead of the game in that sense. And the institutions will be on the bottom. <laughs> Daniel, do you want a comment as a maker? Uh, yes, I mean, I think that um, this notion of uh, the art, uh, media art is kind of these living objects, uh, and Alain described it very well, and I think it's almost, one has to see it almost as a poetic um, element in media art. They, are, they change, they mutate, they transform. We tend to see kind of like the, the aging or obsolescence of artwork as a negative thing, but I mean, in fact, every artwork ages. The difference between media art and painting is in painting, there's legions and legions of conservators and restorers that are constantly restoring these paintings. Um, you know, the Prada Museum told me that it's only about 20% of the original paint applied by the painters is what you get on the canvas. These are centuries of restorations. So in effect, the, 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 the world of conservation, of media conservation is becoming a really fascinating one uh, because it is really going to the heart of the matter. What, what does it mean to keep this work that is 
so alive? What does it mean to conserve it? Is it about putting it in formaldehyde, the way usually museums think of this work? Or is it allowing its mutations, transformations, and permutations through time? So um, in, in effect, I'm finding more interesting thoughts are coming from the world of conservation than from the world of conservatorship or from even from the many cases and, and from the art. As an artist, my intention is basically to think of the times we live in. Um, the art market, uh, and I think the armory is an evidence of that, is totally lacking in this kind of work, which is also significant. I, I haven't taken a close look at the art fair, but I just don't see work that is really trying to reflect on this shifting technologies and how important this is. I will say, though, that um, I feel the pandemic has kind of pushed society, has kind of forced us to kind of become all digital natives. And I have seen an increase of interest in work, artwork that is dealing with, with, uh, with uh, the, the digital implications of the world we live in. I, I've noticed just in the last few months, and it's something I've commented with a lot of colleagues that are working in this field, I've noticed in a huge uh, expansion of interest from, from the art world that we weren't getting before. So that's, that's a positive sign. Yeah, you've said that before, and I think um, from the institutional point of view, and I think probably from the collecting point of view, that, that issue of preservation uh, documentation is the key, or the reluctance to get into and acquire the, the work that deals with technology is precisely that. How do I keep it for posterity? How do I document it properly? What do I do 20 years from now? And what will be the value? I don't have anything material to, 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 to hold on to. Because I think one of the, as I'm listening to you talking, what I'm also particularly interested in is where is the expression and the meaning in the digital world? or in the digital art, because we, we're used to symbolic meaning that art stands for. We're used to different kinds of, or the old traditional aesthetics that goes back to the Burke and the, and the sublime and the 18th century. Don't we need maybe a different ways of talking about this digital art that is part of our, as you said, Alain, digital society, digital age, where we experience everything, not so much physically, not in terms of beauty and judgment and, and, and taste, but in terms of the interchange of machine and humans. And some philosophers talk about it. So um, from somebody who deals with presentations of the work of art, the meaning and the expression is the key. So when you work with digital technology, Danielle, do you think about it? And when you talk to your students, and when you think as a collector of the work, that you're acquiring. Where is the meaning, expression, and the posterity in them? I don't know who wants to do it first. Maybe if you, if you don't mind, um, I just to finish on that conservation because I'm, I'm directly concerned. Uh, because um, it, is, it has been a challenge. Um, it's true that it, it's, it's, um, it's a paradigm. I remember one of the first work I bought was Sibren Burstig. I bought it, by the way, strangely, at the Armory Show from, um, from Rona Hoffman. Um, it was certainly over 15 years ago. Um, what was strange is that I left the fair with a, a portable computer, which were much larger than, than at the time. And it's true that it was a challenge um, to say, oh, okay, this is a work of art. This was a software uploaded on a, on a, on a computer. Um, so that's one of the challenges of the whole thing is that the art world is fundamentally conservative in its buying, in its acquisition, in its speculation, in its markets. And the market is not helpful uh, from, that, uh, from the digital art point of view because they don't understand properly what they are selling. I remember another experience a few years ago. I was listening to a gallery in FIAC in Paris selling a work by Yen Cheng. And they were explaining to the collectors, and yes, you would get uh, everything you need. You would get a USB key. You would um, you get a hard disk and everything. And I, I had to interrupt them and say, yes, but what are you going to do um, with this um, uh, hard disk or this, um, this USB key uh, when the software will not be readable anymore? Um, who will take care of that problem? Um, and that's something that a lot of people 
still don't understand is that a lot of digital arts is about software and the same way as you cannot read uh, your first love letter sent to your first um, uh, lover 20 years ago on the word first number one document or some other support that you read then um, the same way you cannot the same way the the work the digital art you acquired is not there so the frustration in the last 20 years about this is the lack of support that we got from the from the, the marketplace the galleries have no clue still today about what they are selling this is why they, they don't sell it it's because they don't know um, and the fault is not uh, the Amory show uh, the, the fault is the gallerist um, and that's why I believe and I'm defending for a long time I'm fighting for um, an evolution which would be a kind of definition of some standards uh, legal standards because there's a lot of elements linked to copyright and and what you can do and not do with the works but technological as well uh, minimum standards to help maintaining the works in the long term. I, I don't believe anymore it will come from the marketplace and it needs to be taken in hand mostly by collectors and uh, artists. Uh, and my dream is that we sit around the table and we try to solve those uh, very um, essential problems, which will allow then the distribution and the development of, for me, this essential medium. Yeah, I remember our earlier conversation that I think you used the word infrastructure, legal infrastructure, and also like uh, technical infrastructure, how to agree, all of us, um, the artist, the institution, the collector, how to acquire, what is that and we're getting, how to maintain and present correctly so that we're all on the same page. And I think we're all learning that. I can speak from, from my end, uh, how much I learned working with you, um, Danielle, and about so many aspects of digital art that was unknown to me, and I think many institutions are doing exactly the same. Yeah, um, definitely. It's uh, it's a learning experience for all of us. I guess um, as an artist, when one of my um, artworks is purchased by a collector and institution, in fact, I'm already creating a relationship, an ongoing relationship with that collector and that institution particularly with all my recent works that are kind of data-based and, and using live streaming data, uh, the works are connected to the internet so we can remote access them and make tweaks, software updates. But in the, in the end, there is a, a, a relationship with, with a collector or with the institution, in many cases even become friendships through the years. That is something that is, while I'm around, I'm definitely gonna keep on continuing with that relationship. And uh, when I'm not around, I'm hoping the conservation will, will, will start taking on that task. For the cons conservators to understand how to keep these works alive, I think, and this is a comment that we had in a previous conversation with Alan, is documentation. Documentation of the project is fundamental. And this is something that I'm putting a lot of emphasis in my studio, documenting the process of the artworks, how they're getting made, the, the ideas that are kind of crucial to that work, um, the, what is perhaps more peripheral to the artwork. Um, in the end, you know, these works kind of have a life of their own. They have their own biography, and I think the documentation has a way of capturing that. One final comment I would also like to make is that in many ways, uh, media art for me is very connected to uh, traditions that come from the 70s, 60s and 70s for the kind of um, you know, thinking beyond the traditional mediums. Uh, I'm thinking of land art, and I'm thinking particularly performance art, and where a lot of this work we know today thanks to documentation, video and photography. Spiral Jetty by Robert Smithson, we mostly know by these you know, photographs and videos, uh, and so many other performance-based arts only exist today because of the documentation. What we're thinking of, and this is something that I've worked a lot with, with my project manager, Diego Millado, uh, who's also a, a colleague of Nick's through uh, Media Art Conservation, is uh, thinking about self-documenting modes. For example, our internet-based work was collecting data from the internet to create these uh, uh, generative artworks. They're self-documenting themselves. 
we are storing up to six months of data and information. So let's say 20 years from now, if the internet doesn't exist, uh, or it exists through, I don't know, some kind of telepathic connection that we may have through our brains, you will still be able to show this work, maybe not connected to the internet the way it happened in 2021, but just the way we know Joseph Boyce's performances through the photographs, you will be able to experience the artworks, maybe not as an obvious documentation because I would like them to behave and look like they were still live, but they're kind of self-documenting themselves. So we're, we're kind of trying to come up with these innovative words, ways of, of kind of keeping the work live for the future. And to that point, and I know we probably want to get to audience questions before our time runs out, but I, since I disparaged museums, let me just give museums a lot of credit. Well, we're often late to the party. Um, museums, I think, uh, do hold... But we do come to the party. <laughs> we do come to the party, and we bring standardization and categorization and best practices, and the Smithsonian has done a tremendous amount of work in this area. Um, uh, Tate um, has done great work with the Cromlich Collection, the Matters in Media Art Project, which uh, I'd refer you to, and Rhizome uh, is also doing um, great work. Uh, and there are others in this space. So um, there's a lot that, that is being done that needs to be done to formalize the uh, way that we um, uh, preserve, document, and collect. Collect, um, but also talk about it and think about it. And I think there is a different, as I said before, kind of need for theory and philosophy and aesthetics that will tackle all these things because so much has changed. Machine and humanity or humans are taking equal part in creativity. And I think we need to reimagine what creativity means nowadays. And we don't have theoretical framework yet to do that. And, you know, it's a leap of faith. And with that said, I yes, I'm mindful of time. Not much is left, but are there any questions that uh, you would like to ask? Yes, please. Uh, hi. As uh, the artist uh, Daniel was saying, at the fair, you don't have a lot of digital or video art, but it doesn't mean that there is less production of digital and video art. And this has been happening, and I, feel, I have this feeling that there is less, actually, digital and video art uh, being seen or shown uh, done 10 years ago, 15 years ago, but it doesn't mean there is less produced. And I wonder if at some point uh, the two worlds are not going to be um, um, completely separated to a point where they will not uh, be joined anymore. And I don't think so far the digital has won all those battles. I mean, I, I think in the best case scenario, uh, uh, digital media art should be integrated into contemporary art. That's how I think of myself as an artist. As a, I define myself really more of, as a visual artist than as a media artist. Um, but uh, if perhaps media art has existed excessively in its own little ghetto, in its own village, with its uh, you know internal kind of discussion. And uh, I think that we need to stop doing that and it needs to be integrated within the larger conversation of, of contemporary art. Um, that kind of uh, visibility uh, or non-visibility I think is, is fluctuating, it's changing. Again, this is all kind of very new um, and at the same time it's not so new. There's being already successive waves of, of different media. Uh, Nick mentioned photography. The surrealists were doing amazing stuff with photography, but it's only really thought of as serious contemporary art, maybe in the 60s and 70s. But uh, so it's, you know, time has a way of, of, of really uh, putting things in their place. And then we're still very much in the early stages, I think. And, you know, thinking historically. Just one, just, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Just uh, one remark. Just uh, drawing attention, you're, you're in New York and you still have one afternoon. Um, there's a, an amazing presentation by Jody um, at Independence, uh, working in the way Daniel described. You know, Jody, it's a, it's a duo um, based in Brussels, and they're really pioneer of the um, digital art. So it's not true that there's not uh, digital art for sale uh, in New York this week. This one, this is definitely one of the best presentations 
for sure. It's interesting because they were hacking um, the internet uh, many years ago, and they're, they're applying the, the principle that uh, Daniel is describing: is they're using data that were recorded, which means it's not it's not live anymore because it's extremely difficult to maintain. But I, I felt uh, underlying this question, and I will be um, bringing the elephant in the room. Um, I, I like a comment I read today by Paddy Johnson. Uh, um, it's important that not to confuse the fact that things are selling or things are selling for expensive prices, and which means that they suddenly, um, and the fact the art world ignores them makes it that the art world is obsolete and we can go on without it and we win online. Of course, we're touching the subject of NFT and the comment of Paddy Johnson was about um, the 24 million uh, board ape NFT auction that was done 101 um, a board ape, knowing that there are 10,000 10, of them. So it means that the total price of the production is something like $2 billion. <laughs> I'm just laughing about this figure. And what was um, the comment of Paddy Johnson is, it's a good example of why having essentially zero ways to sort good and bad art distorts the market. And this is why reading this comment that I decided to make my presentation that way is that we must still use the filter and the, the best people are able to use that filter is um, people like, like Nick or, or like Fizella and just, you know, still able to say whether it's art or not. Um, and that's a key point. Let's not forget it's about art. It's not about just um, something which sells for expensive prices or something which is visually attractive, it needs to really have another dimension. Thank you, Alan. Um, I, we have another question from the public. I um, was in Silicon Valley when they had that art fair many years ago, which was almost humorous. And all the people in the Google world and Facebook world and everyone that came through that supposedly was buying art, which wasn't there, the art advisors were there, they just thought even the digital art that was there, it was humorous. So coming here today, I was actually excited to look for digital art, and then I saw the Stay Rich piece, which is all LED, and it has like a thousand little plugs in the back of it. And I'm like, this is digital art. So to this point, like why is your artwork, A, not at the Armory Show, number two, one, and number two, in someone's home, I find I want something a little bit more analog you know, to look at for me. I mean, if I have a big collection, of course I want some digital art in it. So it's like, how do you introduce that to the um, art advisor world? I mean, I'm, I'm a lobbyist. I put art in lobbies. So I'm trying to introduce digital art to the lobby world, but the means having to redo their walls, and most of them are white marble. So that's an issue. So I'm just bringing that point up and just asking you, like, why do we not see it? Are you not represented? Do you want to answer that? Well, um, Daniel, I was, thank you. I th yeah, thanks for the question. I was supposed to have work here at the Armory, but my gallery, which is in Madrid, Max Estrella, has not been able to travel because of, of the COVID restrictions in the U.S. Uh, and yeah, my, my U.S. galleries, uh, uh, bit forms, they're not, they're not here in, in, the, in the fair. And regarding uh, lobby art, um, I'm actually doing uh, many commissions for lobbies. And one of the interesting things is a lot of these companies that I'm doing projects for, they have huge amounts of technology in their buildings. And they have technicians and maintenance crews that are taking care of them. And I'm finding them much um, more open to uh, featuring work that, involve, that some, has some kind of digital aspect to it than, say, private collectors. So there's, that's, a, that's an interesting um, market for artists like ourselves that uh, is kind of, I think only now the, uh, the gallery world is beginning to understand. It's, a, it's been a, a very, uh, it's been a way that I've been able to finance my studio and keep it going thanks to these commissions. Uh, okay, one more question. Aisha? Okay, it's coming. Thank you. Uh, I will make it very short. But just to follow up with the question from the lo uh, lobby art. Yeah. First of all, I would like to answer to the question about the art fair. 
why Daniel's work is not here, and as well as many other media artists' works. Uh, as somebody who has worked with uh, art fairs many years ago, art fairs I found has uh, they have uh, different criteria selecting artworks because art fairs they are a business. First of all, they need to achieve certain amount of uh, sales to um, cover their cost of production of the events and also cover their receptions for the collectors. It, it's very costly to host, uh, to, to make art fair happen. So uh, when you um, produce an art fair, they must guarantee that the, the, the sales can happen and everybody can go back home with some income in their pocket. So uh, it, it's different from a museum uh, who is uh, producing a artist like Daniel's uh, solo exhibition because the main goal is not the sales, it's actually uh, more educational uh, oriented. So this is the first question. And also to follow that uh, with that, I have some feedback on the conversation today. Um, first of all, I think I, I completely agree with Daniel's opinion about uh, talking about digital art within the contemporary art uh, uh, context. It's a much larger conversation. And uh, if we understand digital art in that conversation, I would say many artists today who use technologies to produce their works, they don't need them because everybody is so um, fascinated by how technologies could, could make their artworks look nice, but actually, um, at the same time, the, the technologies kill the real philosophical meaning of the artworks. But I think um, artwork, art is there to um, tell us a message uh, to educate us uh, more from literature, philosophy, um, to discuss social issues, problems, but not there just to show off some new technologies. Uh, but unfortunately, there aren't so many interesting uh, media arts to look at today, um, as interesting as Daniel's. So maybe that's another reason that uh, many major galleries, they care about the education. They don't want to uh, have a, a new generation of artists to be, to be part of their roster uh, of artists. So this is my personal understanding. It might be wrong. Uh, another, uh, another thing I want to mention is about the collection. Um, because I work can, with... Can you, can you let us answer maybe one by one? Otherwise, we'll forget. Uh, I'll take the one on the art markets. Um, mm. It's the second time today that um, people are kind of being critical about the Amori and saying the Amori this and the Amori this. Um, let's, let's be reminded that an art fair is just a, a jewelry box. What the art fair management does is creating a jewelry box into which the galleries will show the works they decide to show. The Amori has got nothing to decide. So take out the, the art fairs from the, from the thing, you need to go down to the, to the galleries. So you could blame the galleries for not showing digital arts. And it's wrong again, because the galleries are not the one deciding, they're coming here, they're making a very heavy investment which can uh, amount to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and of course they need to recover their costs because they're in the business of making a living. They need to also pay their rent, they pay um, their, the, the education of their children and so on. So the real responsible is the buyer. So the, the buyer is not interested at this level in digital art. Why? Because currently the buyer, particularly in the United States, is obsessed with speculation. Um, the art world is reaching a level of hyper-capitalism where people are looking to buy art in the hope of making a multiple of it in the next few months. Um, the, the flavor of the day is um, African-American um, uh, figurative painting. And this is why there is so much African-American uh, figurative painting in Yamori, despite the fact I'm not in New York, but I know it. So. Um, you need to return the, the other way around. And the context is not about neither the Amory, neither even the galleries. It's about the current uh, system of the market. I mentioned earlier that the, the, the marketplace is doing a very poor job in promoting um, digital arts. And it's because um, first they don't understand it. And second, the collectors 
are not educated for doing it. And this is why we need Nick and his new generation of curators and, and artists and, and maybe even collectors, because there is an, an enormous amount of, of um, uh, education to make. Um, but take out this idea of, uh, of, of the art fair. It's, uh, that's always the first question. The second question, um, I even forget about what it was, so if you want to go on. Yeah, we, we, uh, there is another hand um, up, but then we are running out of time too. So if we can make it really, really brief. Or we can stick around if anybody uh, has and, questions. Uh, come up we can front. finish this. I know this is being recorded. Do you want to quickly say, uh, there is another person who really wanted to jump in very eagerly, uh, and I'm trying to be responsive. It's a question for Alain. Um, um, it's, uh, I didn't understand well the example of the artist and the end result at $2 billion, and also I want to know why it's funny for you. Can you repeat me again yeah, this yeah, question? Yeah. I'm sorry. You, 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 made an, you uh, talked about uh, an artist that is doing some works at 10,000 copies as an NFT, oh, yes. and which will yeah. result of a total value of $2 billion. Yes. And you said it's so funny. It's, it's I want to know why it's funny. Okay, well, I think this is a very, um, this would lead to a long discussion taking us to NFT. So, Alan, if you want to address it very briefly, and then we have to. Yes, extremely briefly. I'm just yeah. precising because you were asking me which artist. So, it's the famous Borg Ape. Um, you see, it's those little avatars that are uh, self generated uh, Borg Ape. Um, so, you can go online and find about it. Uh, it has been created in 10,000 editions, so 101 of them has been sold for 24 million. So if I'm computing well, 10,000 would make a total of 2.4 billion, uh, which is a little strange figure uh, for just an avatar. And that's indeed the, the, the thing. And I go back to my presentation, which I think art must be more than a mem or an avatar. Uh, but it's another discussion indeed. With that, I thank you, Alain, so much. I want to thank our panelists, Nick, and uh, of course, the, uh, Diego, <laughs> Daniel, uh, for sticking around. And I want to thank uh, the Armory team for inviting us and allowing us to present here. Thank you so much. And all of you who uh, spent this beautiful afternoon with us. Uh, thank you. Thank you very Anna. much. Bye-bye.